tonight on CBC Vancouver News. Stop the racial profiling and get indigenous people. This turned into a very unfortunate situation. Protesters rally against a big bank after a grandfather and granddaughter are handcuffed. What Vancouver's police chief has to say. Also, snow, slush, rain and wind. A winter storm makes for challenging commutes across the south coast. And if the child has autism, I think they have the likelihood of benefiting from FMT. Treating autism with feces? A BC naturopath under fire for a controversial therapy. This is CBC Vancouver News. Good evening. New details are emerging tonight about a disturbing incident at a downtown Vancouver Bank of Montreal. As we first reported, that's where a 12-year-old girl and her Indigenous grandfather were arrested and handcuffed. They were just trying to open an account. But BMO suspected fraud and called police. Today, in an interview with me, Vancouver's police chief revealed new and troubling information about the 911 call BPD got from the bank. This as anger about what happened boiled over at BMO's front door. At BMO's main branch in downtown Vancouver, dozens of protesters. The demonstrators later moved inside the bank, where Indigenous elder Maxwell Johnson was last month to open an account for his 12-year-old granddaughter. During their appointment, Johnson says an employee questioned the pair's identification, including their government-issued Indian status cards, and unbeknownst to them, called 911. The information that came in in that call is that it was a fraud in progress. And the information described to the officers through the 911 call is that there were two suspects. One was a 50-year-old South Asian male, and the second one was a 16-year-old South Asian female. So that was the information that the officers had when they were sent it to the bank. And based on that flawed description from the bank of the suspects, Johnson and the girl ended up in handcuffs in the back of a police cruiser. She was just standing there with uh, handcuffs on, and you could just see how, how uh, like, she was crying. So we had two suspects. The officers very politely took them into custody, placed handcuffs on both the people, at that time still believing that we were dealing with a 16-year-old girl and a 50-year-old man. The chief says the officers themselves are from ethnic communities with about five years on the force. And in another statement released today, BMO called what happened unacceptable, saying they deeply regret it and unequivocally apologize. The bank also says it is now establishing an Indigenous Advisory Council in partnership with several chiefs across Canada to support further education and awareness. We're very sorry the way that this all played out, and no, nobody wants to see a young girl in handcuffs or anybody in handcuffs when we know now, after doing the investigation, that there was no crime. But I also want people to know that there was a reason that this happened, the way this played out. But of course, it's uh, not, not a nice situation for anybody involved. As for Johnson, he says he's considering a human rights case against BMO and possibly police for racial profiling. And later this hour, we will have an extended version of my interview with Chief Adam Palmer. You can also watch it in full on our CBC Vancouver YouTube channel. Well, Metro Vancouver is still sloshing its way out of the first snow dump of the year. It wasn't quite snowmageddon, but it sure was messy out there. A burst of snowy weather wreaked havoc across much of the Lower Mainland today. There were traffic and transit delays and the return of the dreaded bridge ice bombs. According to ICBC, 36 of them on the Port Man, 21 on the Alex Fraser. But it wasn't just the roads impacted. Strong winds meant 63 ferry cancellations. Our Mickey Cowan has more on the fallout of a winter storm. A slushy and slow going day for many commuters. I would say 10 to 15 minutes extra. About 30 minutes wait so far. Yes, 30 minutes. 10 minutes, 20 minutes late. Many buses struggling with road conditions and the perpetual issue of that hill to Simon Fraser University. Yeah, I'm late for uni my university. It's in SFU, it's SFU Burnaby. <laughs> I've seen better days here. Yeah. 
This bus in Surrey got completely stuck in deep snowy grooves. Crews doing everything they can to try and get it out. The roads in general across the lower mainland a bit of a mess for drivers and commuters alike. It's like my shoes are drenched, my pants are drenched, so it's, it's really bad, I would say. The Alex Fraser Bridge was closed down due to falling ice, and things weren't much better on the Portman. ICBC says numerous claims are being made for falling ice. Crews elsewhere doing their best to keep main roads clear, but taking longer to get to side streets. As for on the water, dozens of ferry cancellations. We did have to cancel several sailings due to the wind, so we cancelled sailings on our major routes between uh, Vancouver and Victoria, as well as between Vancouver and Nanaimo. In total, 63 sailings cut, only resuming service in the afternoon, but they're not calling the all clear just yet. Well, we are continuing to monitor conditions. We do uh, anticipate there will be wind this weekend. Uh, BC Ferries is asking travellers to check their website before heading out in case the waves get too wild to set sail. And while it's been a stormy ride for many, for some, the weather has been the best news all week. Snow day called in sick for the little guy and went and bought sleds so that we can go sledding. <laughs> it's part of Canada. We are blessed to have this and enjoy it. That's how I see it. Mickey Cowan, CBC News, Surrey. And Brett's here with more coverage tonight on the storm. I think I actually prefer the snow to the kind of slop we got today, at least yes. uh, on the coast, but the, uh, the island was hit as well. Yeah, you've got a very good point there. We are very Vancouver-centric here, but Vancouver Island definitely had a bit of a rough go as well today. I want to show you the radar of what it's looking like right now, and you can see that we're still right now in the thick of it, though it is rain at this point in time here in Vancouver, but across higher elevated regions of Vancouver Island, there is still some snow falling, and this made for some treacherous roads there as well. I want to show you what it looked like earlier on today on stretches of the highway in uh, Vancouver Island. So this would actually be along, I believe, portions of Highway 19 in particular. We'll get there in one second. Lots of people, of course, try to shovel their way out. But a particular concern was this, what you're seeing right now. That is an ambulance flipped upside down. That was just south of Courtney. Nobody was injured in that, and there was no patient on board at the time. So that is some good news. But these weather conditions definitely catching a few people off guard. And I do have some good news, at least. It is going to be improving somewhat for tomorrow. But the trade-off is is, is that we could be dealing with some stronger winds. Temperatures right now all the way across the region still anywhere between three and four degrees. As we go ahead into the weekend though it's worth mentioning we could still be dealing with a few showers throughout the overnight tonight. That could be isolated pockets of mixing. Saturday as far as it's concerned is looking pretty nice with a few mix, uh, mix of sun and clouds but it will be gusty so be aware of that. Okay Brent thanks more from you in a little bit. Sounds good. A BC naturopath is under fire tonight after offering an unusual kind of treatment for autism, Jason Klopp claims he's seen dramatic improvements with a therapy derived from human feces. But as Bethany Lindsay reports, there are questions about the science and the risks. If a child has autism, I think they have the likelihood of benefiting from FMT. FMT. That's short for fecal microbiota transplant. It's made from bacteria and other microbes taken from the feces of a healthy person. Patients take it orally or by enema. It's shown promise for treating a range of gastrointestinal issues, but naturopath Jason Klopp claims it can also treat autism. I just want to see dramatic improvements in digestion, language, behavior, sleep, cognitive ability, social awareness, um, social interaction. So we see all of those things. FMT isn't approved for use on autism in Canada or the U.S., so Klopp offers retreats at a clinic in Mexico. The cost? $15,000 U.S. I think currently the risks are way too high to be doing this as a medical treatment. Scientists tell CBC they're alarmed. The science isn't solid. One study suggests fecal transplants could help with autism, but it was very small, had no control group, and didn't account for the placebo effect. And the study authors recommend against going to see CLOP for treatment, saying the research isn't conclusive. Doctors say patients could be at risk for serious infection. Charging $15,000 to people without having really confirmed data is, 
it, it's really borders on ethical, being very unethical. Health Canada says it's looking into Klopp's business. It's also caught the attention of officials in BC, including the College of Naturopathic Physicians and even the province's top doctor, who says she has a warning for parents. This is an experimental unproven treatment that has dangers, so I would not recommend that anybody use this type of treatment. Klopp declined an interview with CBC. Bethany Lindsay, CBC News, Vancouver. The prospect of a pipeline standoff looms once again tonight. Supporters of the Wet'suwet'en First Nation turned up in several places across the province today. The first at David Eby's constituency office. As Attorney General, he has the power to uphold um, UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People, which this government has committed to and um, are not following through with. The Wet'suwet'en are fighting to stop work on the coastal gas link pipeline in northern BC. Hereditary chiefs issued an eviction notice saying the gas company is illegally trespassing on their land. Coastal gas link, however, says it has agreements with 20 First Nation councils along the pipeline's path. Wet'suwet'en hereditary chiefs and their supporters rallied in the cold and snow in Smithers this afternoon. They are demanding talks between the provincial and federal governments to resolve the impasse. What happened to the Wet'suwet'en and our supporters should never happen in a democratic free country. The hereditary chiefs say they never have and never will give Coastal Gas Link approval to move ahead with the project. And students from the University of Victoria walked out of classes this morning. Close to 100 students marched to the steps of BC's legislature. Their message, UVic is complicit in what they say is the violation of Wet'suwet'en sovereignty. The federal government has now lowered the number of Canadian victims in the downed Ukrainian airliner crash just a short time ago. With updated information on birth dates and travel documents, the number now stands at 57. That's down from 63. In the meantime, mourners are at two vigils at the University of British Columbia tonight. Our Tina Lovegreen is live inside the UBC nest. And Tina, this is the second vigil there at UBC. That's right, um, we've moved inside and as you can see, there are candles and flowers, but this vigil began outside. It began with naming every victim that was on that plane crash and then a moment of silence followed by people laying flowers beside those lit candles and then they moved inside here. And as you mentioned, this is the second vigil because UBC has a strong connection to um, three of the people that were on that plane crash. Um, two of them were siblings, Mohammed Hossein Assad Lari and Zainab Assad Lari. And then third, Mehran Abtai, who was actually just coming here to study his postdoctorate. And now I'm here with two of the organizers who helped organize this vigil, vigil rather, um, Kimia and Kiana, um, sorry, I forgot your name, Zia Fat. Um, tell me why it was important to organize a second vigil here tonight. Um, I think uh, the, the first vigil was uh, to uh, uh, commemorate the memories of Zainab and Mohammed Hossein. So that was uh, more of a very personal uh, vigil, mostly for the really close friends of the two victims. Uh, the second vigil today is the first one in Vancouver that is uh, remembering all the victims of the um, crash. So we thought it, it was important because uh, a lot of people have lost uh, individuals in this crash, so um, it's more than just the UBC community that has been affected by this. Canada has been affected by it, and we had a large crowd from different cultural backgrounds, different religious backgrounds, coming together, remembering all the lives that were lost today. And I know you guys knew um, one of the victims personally, and there were so many tears here tonight. Um, tell me how the student body here is feeling. Um, we're very shocked, honestly. We did not expect this to happen, but it did. And we just want everyone at UBC to know that the four organizations that made the two vigils happen, we are here for all the students and even faculty members. Um, I wasn't very close to Zainab, but I remember that she was a very kind individual. I would always see her in the library. She was always wearing a smile on her face. and. 
I think all we can do is live on with their legacy and make them proud. Um, very emotional uh, night here, Mike, um, and there will be more vigils planned. Um, two will be planned at the Vancouver Art Gallery, gallery one tomorrow from 2 to 3, another on Sunday from 12.30 to 2.30, and there will be other celebrations of life planned throughout uh, the weekend. Friends and family of Daniel and Faye Saket will gather to remember the North Vancouver couple, and later the lives of Firuza Madani and Nasa Pushaban Oshubi will be remembered at the Polygon Art Gallery on Saturday as well. And Sunday, the Port Coquitlam family of three, Ardalon, Nilufar, and Kamyar Hamidi will be remembered. And you can find more of those, uh, more information on that on our website. And I, I wanna thank you both, Kimia and Kiana Aziafat, for, for, for being with us today and for organizing this. I think it means a lot for the community. Thank you. Mike. Okay, Tina, thanks very much. Tina Love Green live tonight at UBC. Well, the latest flu report from the BC Centre for Disease Control shows a bit of a surge in cases over the holidays. Despite the spike in flu cases around the province, experts say, BC experts say, we may finally have a milder season of illness compared to the past few years. CDC says it often sees a delayed spike in cases at this time of year due to people mingling over the holidays. This year, though, the increase so far is within or below historic averages. Experts still advise everyone to get a flu shot. Lawyers for the federal government say Meng Wanzhou is alleged to have committed fraud. The Huawei executive, currently living under house arrest in her Vancouver home, is accused of violating U.S. sanctions against Iran. But lawyers for the attorney general say in court filings that the essence of the charges against her are fraud a crime in both Canada and the U.S. They say she lied to HSBC Bank about Huawei's relationship with a hidden subsidiary accused of violating American sanctions. And Huawei got a $1.5 billion loan based on that lie, according to the documents. On January 20th, B.C. Supreme Court will hold a week-long hearing to determine whether the crime for which the U.S. wants her extradited is, in fact, a crime in Canada. And a reminder, you can watch this newscast live on CBC Gem. The free app is also where you can find other CBC programs. And CBC Vancouver is also on Facebook, YouTube, and Instagram. Coming up, the latest on the crash in Iran and the growing anger over the investigation on the ground. Oh, good evening. Thanks for staying with us on our live stream during the commercial break on television. Well, as we told you earlier, today's snowfall in the Lower Mainland has created some chaos. It was certainly sloppy out there, but it is nothing compared to what we've had in the past. So for a special Flashback Friday, we're going to take a look at the 1996 snowstorm that brought, yes, 65 centimeters of snow to Victoria. Sweeping and shoveling were the provincial sport this morning as we slowly dug out of the biggest dumping of snow we've ever seen. That's totally bizarre, yeah. Uh, I've lived here since 51 and I've never seen snow like this before. Over 35 centimeters of snow fell on Vancouver, creating drifts up to a meter high. All 16 of the city's plows and sanding trucks were out trying to keep the roads clear, but it was a losing battle. Most streets were left an unplowed mess, making driving almost impossible. Ambulance crews were responding to extreme emergency calls only. The only cars getting around had four-wheel drive and a set of chains. Transit was very slow. Buses were constantly getting stuck. You may get SkyTrain service to your station today, and you may not. And by mid-morning, the SkyTrain was completely shut down. Uh, they're saying that we have to find alternate means of transportation, and this sort of was our alternate means of transportation, so I guess we're hiking. Most highways out of town were closed. All manner of cars and trucks were being hauled out of the snow all day long. Even some plows were getting stuck. For those trying to escape the blizzard, the airport was a nightmare. Planes were covered with ice and snow. Only one in ten were getting off the ground. Hundreds of flights were cancelled, leaving thousands of passengers stranded. We were going to downtown Florida. 
They're going to try and get us into Minneapolis, but we've got a really tight connection and we're delayed here. If you're not on one of the flights that uh, hasn't been cancelled, you're going to be waiting until tomorrow morning most likely. At BC Place Stadium, they were furiously trying to clear snow off the dome as it slowly began to sag under the weight of the snow. And at the Royal Vancouver Yacht Club, crews were busy clearing snow off boathouses all day for fear they might collapse as well. And if you thought all that was bad, Victoria had twice the problems. In the last 24 hours, 65 centimeters of snow has fallen. No one has ever seen anything like it. Snow is waist deep. Well, I just say that henceforth, the city shall be known as Victoria Peg. The worst I've seen in 48 years. I'm just going to go in and have cold beer. <laughs> Just a handful of stores are open, and this is pretty much the only way to get to them. The province has stopped short of declaring a state of emergency, but it has called in the Army. Late this afternoon, the snow began to change to freezing rain, and it's forecast to warm up tomorrow. That's good and bad news. The snow might start to melt, but it's expected there will be lots of flooding. John Rao, CBC News, Vancouver. All right, we'll be back with more on the Iran crash in just a couple of seconds. The investigation into what happened to Flight 752 continues tonight, and the Canadian government is joining other Western nations pressing Iran for answers. Canadian investigators still don't have access to the crash site, and meanwhile, some airlines are refusing to fly Tehran over safety concerns. Chris Brown is in Kiev with Iran's response to the investigation. The truth about what brought down Ukraine International Airlines Flight 752 may be locked away on the data disks inside the aircraft's two black boxes, which were shown off on Iranian TV. Today, the U.S. Secretary of State added his voice to the growing chorus of those claiming Iran shot the plane down by mistake. We, we do believe that it's likely that that plane was shot down by an Iranian missile. Uh, we are, we're going to let uh, the investigation play out. Whatever evidence Western intelligence agencies have, they're not sharing it publicly. But there are now several videos that appear to show a plane being struck midair near Tehran's airport. And yet, Ukraine, which is playing a key role in the probe with 45 investigators now at the Tehran crash site, is holding off judgment. We will come to our conclusions. We don't want to, to come to them right now. Speaking to the media in Kyiv tonight, the foreign minister continued to walk a tightrope, supporting allies such as Canada, but trying not to alienate Iran. Those videos that the world has seen now, which appear to show an object going up and striking an aircraft and the aircraft turning back, if that's not a missile, how do you explain that? We have so many different pictures and videos right now which we are considering, and not us as diplomats, but the professionals. We have to know where, who shot the, the video. Iranian authorities claim the plane crashed as a result of a technical fault without providing any evidence about why they believe that. The country's ambassador to London reiterated the same on British TV. So we are, uh, in fact, uh, confident from our side that there has been no missile launched in that area at, at that time. Tonight, the semi-official Iranian news agency FARS suggested Iran's government would have more to say about the crash and its cause on Saturday. As for the investigation, multiple reports suggest the crash site has already been bulldozed, though again Ukraine is downplaying that, saying the aircraft's parts have been moved to a hangar for reconstruction. Chris Brown, CBC News, Kyiv. Getting to the crash site itself comes with its own challenges. Aerial footage shows just how expansive it is, and as Ashley Burke tells us, Canada is putting pressure on Iran for access. Canada has pushed for access since day one. Now it has reinforcements. This group brings together representatives of Ukraine, Sweden, Afghanistan and the United Kingdom who are all grieving and also searching for answers. Countries who lost citizens now forming an international response group. One voice to put pressure on Iran. We want full accountability. We want answers to these questions. And the world is watching what the Iranian government is doing now. 
What they want is to be part of the investigation, to make sure it's transparent and thorough. So far, Iran hasn't granted that. But under international requirements, Canada is allowed to visit the crash site and receive updates on the case. Every country that does an investigation needs other countries to help, other resources to help. There's no doubt about it. And they need people, expertise. Uh, they need the people that, are, that know the information about the operation, about the aircraft, to come and help them. Two Transportation Safety Board investigators are in Turkey waiting for visas. But by the time they get to Tehran, there may not be much of a scene left. That's not the normal way of handling it all. It says very shoddy work. And the integrity of the crash site is very important for so many reasons. You map where you get the wreckage from to see how the airplane broke up. When a missile brought down Malaysian Airlines Flight 17, investigators reconstructed the plane piece by piece, searching for definitive proof of what brought it down. That's the next step for investigators in Iran. There's a lot of pieces. You can see the wreckage is all broken up. Identifying the pieces, difficult sometimes, takes a lot of work, has to be done systematically, and takes a long time. The two Canadians granted visas so far are consular officials responsible for helping families and identifying victims. But 10 more Canadian officials still want in. Ashley Burke, CBC News, Ottawa. The United States imposed a new set of sanctions on Iran today. They target senior Iranian officials and important sectors of that country's economy. The U.S. Treasury Secretary says they're in response to Tehran's attack on U.S. troops in Iraq this week. We are taking action against eight senior Iranian officials who advanced the regime's destabilizing activity and were involved in Tuesday's ballistic missile strike. Mnuchin was joined at that news conference by U.S. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo. They say the new measures deprive Tehran from further destabilizing the Middle East. Some of the sectors targeted include Iran's manufacturing, mining and textile sectors. A grandfather and his 12-year-old granddaughter placed in handcuffs at a bank of Montreal and Vancouver after they tried to open a bank account. The Vancouver police chief on why it happened next.
Here are some of the stories we're following tonight on CBC Vancouver News. My shoes are drenched, my pants are drenched. Yeah, it was a slow, wet and windy day to get around the south coast as a winter storm dumped snow and rain across our region. Numerous ferry sailings were cancelled and while we may get a break from the precipitation this weekend, temperatures are going to be well below freezing and they're on the way. I think currently the risks are way too high to be doing this as a medical treatment. Doctors are warning against a Vancouver naturopath's unusual treatment for autism, fecal transplants. Scientists argue the pricey therapy could put children at serious risk for infections. The process is not approved in Canada or the U.S. The naturopath is doing them in Mexico. As we mentioned earlier, new details are emerging tonight about a disturbing incident at a downtown Vancouver Bank of Montreal. As we first reported, that's where a 12-year-old girl and her Indigenous grandfather were arrested and handcuffed. They were just trying to open an account, but BMO suspected fraud and called police. Today, in an interview with me, Vancouver's police chief revealed new and troubling information about the 911 call BPD got from the bank. Uh, chief, let me ask you first of all, why were this young girl, this 12-year-old girl and her grandfather uh, placed in handcuffs at this bank by your officers? Sure, Mike. So I think it's important to have some context of what happened. I've seen some of the reporting and it is missing a few gaps. So I'll, I'll fill those in for you just so you have a fuller yeah. picture. So our officers received a 911 call to the BMO down at the Bentall Centre on Burrard Street. The information that came in in that call is that it was a fraud in progress. And the information described to the officers through the 911 call is that there were two suspects. One was a 50-year-old South Asian male and the second one was a 16-year-old South Asian female. So that was the information that the officers had when they were sounded to the bank. The two officers arrived at the bank. Upon arriving, the two suspects were pointed out. And standard police procedure anywhere in Canada, this is not unique to Vancouver or anywhere else you know, in the city. This is a Canadian standard in policing. When you're responding to a crime and process, the first thing you do is go in and take charge and calm down the situation. So we had two suspects. The officers very politely took them into custody, placed handcuffs on both the people, at that time still believing that we were dealing with a 16-year-old girl and a 50-year-old man. Of course, now we know when the officers did a thorough investigation that there was in fact no fraud and everything was above board and it was totally legitimate. Yet when they arrived at the bank, they weren't able to make the distinction that the information that they had received from the bank about these two individuals, the two suspects, was clearly wrong. They, they weren't dealing with uh, two South Asian uh, individuals? Well, they could see that they weren't dealing with two South Asian individuals, but they would have no way of knowing instantaneously whether the information was legitimate or not. I know both of those officers. They're young. Both of the officers that responded come from diverse communities as well. And they're very young, respectful, compassionate officers doing a really good job out there. Of course, this turned into a very unfortunate situation, but I just want the public to know that our officers really were acting in good faith and doing the best with the information they had at the time. And I guess what, what some people find troubling is that it, it was, in fact, at the end of the day, a 12-year-old girl in handcuffs. Yes, and I can understand that because th that's unfortunate to see a 12-year-old girl in handcuffs. The information the officers had, though, is that it was a 16-year-old girl, and it wasn't until they had time to go in and actually things calmed down and they figured out the situation that she was only 12 and that everything was legitimate, and they did take the handcuffs off. Would you like to say anything to the uh, the gentleman and his granddaughter in, involved in this uh, unfortunate situation? Well, it's a very unfortunate situation. We're very sorry the way that this all played out. And no, nobody wants to see a young girl in handcuffs or anybody in handcuffs when we know now after doing the investigation that there was no crime. But I also want people to know that there was a reason that this happened, the way this played out. But of course, it's uh, not, not a nice situation for anybody involved. Okay. Thanks for doing this. Thank you. At 6.34, here's a live shot uh, from Revelstoke tonight, uh, where it's clearly snowing. You think we have a lot of snow, they, they certainly have it there. Brett's going to be back with more on what wintry weather the weekend might bring next.
house for something a little more uh, animated tonight. A hilariously wrong answer on Family Feud Canada on Thursday night has gone viral. It started when host Jerry D asked, what's Popeye's favorite food? Name Popeye's favorite food. Chicken. Yeah, Yves Dubois lost her family from Lorette, Manitoba, the chance to win $10,000 for that answer. But she did win the attention of millions around the world. Some people have said they can understand why a millennial would think the Popeye's chicken instead of the sailor man, right? That character was created... Come on, I love... ...almost 100 years ago. The weather update is brought to you by The Body Shop that always takes you back to your happy place. BC's favorite, Craftsman Collision, Air Miles, and Bigger Smiles. She was so <laughs> proud of the <laughs> answer, though. She's so confident. Yeah. You can tell she's like, Chicken. I got this. <laughs> the poor <laughs> host and pretty well. Oh, everyone I else. love it. It was great. Uh, good, good times. Great, great. Good times. She made a mess of it, uh, yes. as mm. was the case uh, out here today. Very messy, mm. and I'm willing to say, this is going to be an interesting one. You know, I, you and I keep track of our Saturdays. Yes, we do. Yeah, I don't think it's going right to be, yeah, it's, it's not going to be that bad. It'll be a little bit windy, but we're saving it for Sunday instead. And keep those snow tires on, keep all of your winter gear, you are going to need it. But let's take a look back at this morning to really just, you know, reflect on the mess that it was. This was in the downtown core, of course. There are apparently the North Shore Mountains behind there. You would not be able to tell just so much rain and so much snow. And yes, that is going to be the trend as we get into the next few days. And the reason being, I wanted to start off with this map here. We have extreme cold warnings that are really blanketing much of Western Canada. So from Manitoba all the way to the Yukon, we are dealing with wind chill values that could be close to minus 45. So this includes places into the BC Peace region. We go farther south and travel still going to be a little bit dicey for the remainder of this evening into the overnight. We could be seeing an additional 20 to 40 centimeters of snow along Highway 3 and Kootenai Pass. And close to us, well, our story becomes the wind story. So the precipitation is easing, but we are still looking at the potential for wind gusts to be coming out of the northwest at to 90 kilometers an hour tomorrow morning and into the afternoon. So for tonight, it's going to be calming down. We're going to get a little bit of a break. We can catch our breath. But by tomorrow afternoon, really, if you are considering maybe going on one of the ferries, there is a good likelihood that there are going to be a few cancellations because it just simply would not be safe to sail with wind conditions like that. And of course, our story doesn't end with the wind. It really does continue to be a precipitation story. Saturday, by first thing in the morning, we're going to be clearing up. I think the sun is going to come out. It's going to be a welcome little break. But Saturday night into Sunday, we'll say hello to the snow round two. And the difference here is that we could be seeing this snow stick around throughout Sunday as many of us get stuck into that snowy pattern for the majority of Sunday and into Monday. All of this cold air is going to just be funneling right down from the north and that means when you see temperatures like this in your five-day forecast don't be too alarmed we are looking at highs for both monday and tuesday up to five maybe even ten degrees below normal and our overnight lows in the negative double digits so stay warm my friends all right thank you brett we'll yeah. take note of saturday we'll ma make yes. a note of it. yes <laughs> thank you thanks well royal watchers are keeping a close eye on the latest from the duke and duchess of sussex after Meghan and Harry announced their intention to take a step back from their senior royal duties. As Deanna Simonac Johnson reports, it looks like Markle is back in Canada. As the world learned, Meghan Markle is now in Canada. Joining her infant son, Archie, the British headlines were unsparing. I think people were very surprised to discover that, that Meghan has gone back to Canada so soon. But Prince Harry and Meghan tend to move at a different pace than the rest of the royal family. Author Katie Nichols says she was told there were telephone calls between Prince Harry and his family during his and Meghan's Canadian Christmas break. And Harry was making it very clear in those conversations that he wanted to put a strategy in place to make an announcement that they would be moving to Canada. But the palace stressed that these were, you know, talks that were at a very early stage, but not as far as the Sussexes were concerned. By Wednesday, a new web page had sprung up. Modern, sleek, and designed by a Toronto company. The couple applied to trademark the name Sussex Royal six months ago. The strategist says he would have advised a similar approach. I think easier to get forgiveness than permission. So in this case, it was a bit of a scorched earth, bold approach. 
Part of that approach, a new media policy. They will no longer grant access to the traditional press accredited as royal correspondents, but will engage with grassroots media organizations and young up-and-coming journalists. That makes a lot of sense because why speak to the seven publications that you might not like the way you've been covered for the last 20 or 30 years or your whole life uh, when there's up-and-coming publications and those publications are going to reach the young people, which is really where, you, where they want to be. It also means they'll be more likely to control what aspect of their lives their fans get to see, meaning that even if Harry and Meghan were to move to Canada, they may remain as elusive as ever. Deanna Sumanak-Johnson, CBC News, Toronto. Well, after a brief respite, wildfires in Australia are raging once again. And in the cities, another type of rage, angry protesters calling out the government over inaction. We'll take you down under next. In 2018, an arrest was made that put Canada into the middle of a trade war between the United States and China. I'm Stephen Quinn, the host of the CBC Vancouver original podcast, Sanctioned, the arrest of a telecom giant. The extradition hearing of Huawei CFO Meng Wanzhou begins on January 20th. Stay on top of the story with a new episode of Sanctioned, arriving Monday. Make sure you're subscribed to Sanctioned on the CBC Listen app or wherever you get your podcasts. Two hundred forty thousand people in southeast Australia are being advised to leave the area ahead of possible flare-ups in bushfires. Firefighting crews are taking defensive action, and in some places, the weather is cooperating. Even with rain in Melbourne, even with forecast better conditions next week, there is a long way to go. And of course, the fire is dynamic as we speak. Erratic wind conditions are expected through Saturday. And two massive fires merge to create what they're calling a mega fire. The government is urging people to remain on high alert. Of course, these fires began in September, chewing through more than 10 million hectares of drought-stricken land. The persistence of the situation triggered the latest in a series of rallies across Australia and elsewhere against inaction on climate change. David Common has more from the scene of the largest protest in Sydney. 
On the very day that the bushfires are once again flaring across Australia, driven by a heat wave and higher winds, there are thousands of people out on the street demanding action on climate change. You see many thousands of them here in Sydney. There are many more in other cities, cities that are in some cases covered by a haze of smoke. That is because these fires, which have destroyed more than a thousand homes in this one state, New South Wales, resulted in deaths, deaths of not just people, but hundreds of millions of animals. Many people in this crowd are saying that it is in part the result of climate change. Not that climate change is somehow sparking these fires, which are normal within Australian life, but that, it, that climate change has created the conditions under which uh, it's much easier for these fires to burn, to burn longer, to burn hotter, to burn almost without being able to be stopped. And that is precisely what's going out on the front lines right now, where firefighters are struggling to control these blazes once again, while people are demanding the government of Scott Morrison, the um, Prime Minister here in Australia, they're demanding either that he leave office or that he take urgent action on climate change, which they say is clearly driving this season's fires. David Common, CBC News, Sydney. And Canadian officials have announced more firefighters are heading down under to help out. 29 more incident management personnel and 40 firefighters are going to join the efforts. Crews will come from across Canada, including some from B.C. A powerful bomb tore through a mosque in Pakistan this evening, killing at least 13 people and wounding 20 others. The explosion happened during evening prayers. One of the victims and the likely target was a senior police officer. The bombing is just the latest in a recent series of violent attacks on paramilitary forces Many insurgent groups operate in the region, but so far, none have claimed responsibility. Our former politician, Lieutenant Governor and lawyer John Crosby has died. As Peter Cowan reports, for decades in both Ottawa and on his home turf in Newfoundland and Labrador, Crosby was a force to be reckoned with. John Crosby was never politically correct, right? I wasn't afraid of my shadow. In a province of colourful characters, John Crosby was one of the most colourful, a man who didn't back down. I didn't take the fish from the goddamn water. In Newfoundland and Labrador, he's the man who shut down the cod fishery in 1992, putting 30,000 people out of work. He didn't shy away from the protesters or from speaking his mind. Whether it was fishermen or politicians, John Crosby always had a witty line, even if it frequently crossed the line. Just quieten down, baby. <laughs> to withdraw those remarks. When he faced controversy, he didn't shrink away. He seemed to revel in it. She can't take a joke. You people, you can't take a joke either. Believe it or not, Crosby had to overcome shyness when he first got involved in politics, briefly on the St. John's Council before joining the cabinet of Newfoundland and Labrador's first premier, Joey Smallwood, at age 36. Crosby challenged Smallwood for the leadership of the Liberal Party and lost, sending him across the aisle to join the Progressive Conservatives. He entered federal politics in 1976. All right, John C. Crosby, do solemnly. He was finance minister in Joe Clark's short-lived government, one he later described as long enough to conceive, just not long enough to deliver. He was back in cabinet under Brian Mulroney and was key to getting the 1985 Atlantic Accord signed. That deal would turn around Newfoundland and Labrador's economic fortunes, leading to offshore oil development and pouring billions in oil royalties into the province's pockets. Crosby left politics in 1993, but stayed in the spotlight as Chancellor of Memorial University and then as the province's Lieutenant Governor. Don't have to worry about whether you vote for me or not. Kiss my arse. <laughs> Crosby aspired to more. He never could win the federal or provincial leaderships, but John Crosby knows how he wants to be remembered. I certainly feel that I gave the best I could and I was as straight and honest as it's possible to be in politics today. Peter Cowan, CBC News, St. John's. And Canada has lost a musical legend. Rush drummer Neil Peart has died. We're going to look back at his life and music after the break.
Monday on the early edition. If you think housing is expensive in Vancouver, it is even more so in Hong Kong. Our story producer, Winston Cito, will join us to look at a community-driven housing solution from Hong Kong that could be adopted here. Canadian musician Neil Peart has died. The drummer for the legendary rock band Rush succumbing to brain cancer on Tuesday. Our Eli Glasner looks back at his life and his music. In the world of rock, there was only one Rush. And a big part of the sound of the Canadian rock trio was the man behind one of the biggest drum kits in the business. But the only thing more expansive than Rush's sound was Neil Peart's lyrics. Geddy Lee's vocals, but Peart's poetic visions. Born in 1952, Peart fell in love with drumming at an early age. In 1974, Rush was looking for a new drummer for a tour. Guitarist Alec Lifeson knew the moment he saw Peart drumming triplets with his feet, this was no ordinary player. Although his initial salary was only $125 a week, Rush went on to become one of the biggest bands to ever emerge from this country. Tonight, at this music shop, drummers paid tribute to his distinctive sound. Well, he was the original uh, rock virtuoso, pretty much. He's absolutely incredible, better than almost anybody. And again, his body of work. It's a pretty amazing thing. It's a sad day for all of us, right? You know, Peart was a pretty amazing, um, influential, and beautiful individual. But along with success, there was also great tragedy in his life. In 1997, his only child was killed in a car accident. A few months later, his wife died. Devastated, Peart briefly left the band and wrote about it in the book Ghost Rider. In 2012, Rush received the Governor General's Performing Arts Award, and Peart joked about the first time he picked up the sticks. My parents are here tonight who started me with drum lessons at the age of 13 and unleashed 48 years of noise upon the world. In 2015, he retired from touring to spend more time with his new wife and daughter. In his lyrics, Neil Peart wrote about the illusion of immortality. The drummer died at the age of 67, but his singular sonic legacy lives on. Eli Glasner, CBC News, Toronto. And you can always find this newscast on cbc.ca slash bc. Our next local news at 11 o'clock with Dan Burrett right after the national. Well, it has been an emotional week for Canadians and particularly our country's Persian community. We're going to leave you tonight with a poem written by Mariam Zaraninejad, a local resident who expressed her condolences to the victim's family through this fictional poem. It's written from the perspective of a child who is on that doom flight from Tehran saying goodbye to their mother. خدا حافظ مادر خدا حافظ مادر رفته بودم تا قلب تکه پاره از کوچه اجباریم را وصل پینه ای کنم و برگردم رفته بودم مرهمی به زخم های دلم بگذارم تا بتوانم برای مبارزه با سختی های مسیر پرسنگلاخ مهاجرت آماده باشم دلم میخواست بیشتر کنارت بمانم ولی با چشمانی گریان مرا راهی کردی و گفتی برو عزیزم پرواز کن تا در امان باشی شاید اینجا جنگ بشود برو نازنینم نمان برو هواپیمایم که بلند شد نفس راحتی کشیدی دستان لرزانت را به سوی آسمان بلند کردی که خدایا شکر فرزندم در امان است چشمانت را بستی تا دل نگرانت قدری آرام گیرد که خبر رسید دیگر عشقایت تا عبد خوشک نخواهند شد تو در غم دوری و پروازم قوتور بودی که فهمیدی فرزندت نه به آن سوی دنیا که به دنیای ابدی کوچ کرده است مرا که راهی می کردی آیا یادت نبود که ما بچه های خاورمیانه هیچ کجا در امان نیستیم؟ با خودت فکر نکردی که ما یا در جنگ کشته می شویم یا در دریا غرق می شویم یا هواپیمای من سقوط می کند و یا اینکه در جاده ها تلف می شویم 
خدا حافظ ما در جان دوستت دارم خوشحالم که آخرین تصویری که قبل از پرواز در خاطرم بود صورت مهربان تو بود برایت آرزوی صبر و بردباری دارم خدا حافظ پدرم دیگر نگران من نباش امیدوارم بتوانی غم از دست دادنم را تاب بیاوری و خدا حافظ وطنم آرزو می کنم که خداوند تو را از دشمن از خوشسالی و از دروغ حفظ نماید خدا حافظ <تصفيق>